Some people, some people might call the Donald Trump the low life of my TV career, but that, he, he, he mentioned the jacket, so I'll just do it right off the bat. Normally I work it in uh, a little bit later, but since he did this and he's, his, his attire is so freaking boring, I think it's only appropriate that I show you the business mullet which is business on the outside and then party on the inside, so which is a little bit reflective of what you should be. And I'm from South Dakota. Anyone here from South Dakota? Never is, but I always like to ask. Uh, this is what we'd call population density right here. No, I'm not shitting you. You'd be like the fifth largest city in the state of South Dakota. People, that's funny, you can laugh. This is gonna be a little different than the normal talks that you've seen today. And. Um, First time at being with you and before we break for lunch and you got Maynard and we just had an unbelievable speaker just before, as all of them, I watched a couple. Uh, reminds me the first time I met my wife's great grandma. My wife is five foot one, about 105 pounds. And I'm six foot three, 280 some pounds. And, and Grandma Agnes is even smaller than Tammy. And the first time she met me, she looked up at Tammy. She looked way up at me. She looked at Tammy. She looked way up at me and turned back to Tammy and said, isn't he bigger than necessary? <laughs> so, so I feel like that somewhat this morning. Let me talk to you just briefly about a story. I was chief marketing officer of Eastman Kodak. I left about three years ago. and. Uh, you know, while I was there, and now, and now as I do, I did three times, did Bloomberg three times yesterday. Um, and every time I'm on, somebody always asks me about Kodak and what the hell happened. And, and I want to talk to you about that because you're at the forefront of what you're doing and how you're doing it. But I'm watching some of the similar mistakes being occur, occur not only just with startups. Now, I've bought and sold over 250 different companies, over $25 billion in transactions. And you know I'm sitting on funds of 100 million, and I just took to, we took two companies public this week, and and uh, which yesterday one of them went up 10 percent, which is awesome. Um, raised another nine million dollars in the last two weeks for another company that we've got going. So I understand, but I'm watching what I call this hubris of success that Jim Collins has actually talked about in one of his books, and Kodak was that way. You imagine, you know, people say, what happened with Kodak? Why did they go bankrupt? And they went bankrupt, you know, a year ago. And they, I said, well, they didn't go bankrupt a year ago. They actually went bankrupt in 1975. In 1975, a gentleman by the name of Steve Sasson put some digital components together of uh, various pieces and created the very first digital camera in 1975. And on a cold December night in Rochester, New York, he took a picture of a picture. And I mean, how ironic was that? And then you can imagine what it was like for him to be the inventor of the digital camera. He's going to change digital photography forever. As he walked into executives like myself and one CEO office to CMO office to CFO office, as he went from office to office office and they told him to put it away. See, because they kept saying they're a film business. That's what they described themselves. They said, we're a film business. They weren't in the film business. If you're a film business, you're dead. When I, st when I stepped in at Kodak, they were doing $17 billion just in film cartridges alone. And when I left, four years later, $200 million in revenue around that film cartridge. They were never in the film business. If you think about it, fundamental, they had the only product that people would actually run back into a burning building to save. That's what they had. I know that to be true. I mean, back in 2001, I was struck by lightning in my home in South Dakota. Lightning actually came through the house, came all the way down three stories into the basement, struck me. I'm out. I can't hear. I can't see. As I'm waking up, my wife is running by with a box of photos going, are you okay? Right? <laughs> Absolutely true story. Gentlemen, just so you know where you, you rank. All right? <laughs> Because even in a digital world, they'll be grabbing the hard disk running and saying, are you okay? And the only product that people would run back into a burning building to save. They were never in the film business. They were in the emotional technology business. But yet they failed to grasp that. And I'm watching companies, some of the biggest companies. You can imagine back in, oh, 30 years ago, they had the, whole, they had the highest market cap of any company in the world. You could take the three auto companies, combine them, they even had, they were worth more than that, 198,000 employees worldwide. And look at them today. I'm watching companies just down the road that are exactly the same. Their hubris of success, their, their blatant arrogancy is going to drive them to fail. And you'll see their products on many of your desks today, whether you like them or not. So I want to talk to you about change. And when I talked about your 
hubris of success and where you think you are because I know what it's like to be an entrepreneur. We're a little cocky, we're a little strong about what we're doing, how we're doing, but I'm telling you, it's not just you that makes it happen. It's the partnerships, it's the various things that drive it. And so at the same time, you're gonna find people who are gonna get in the way, and I put this at the front of my book at all the naysayers, opportunists, obstructions to stand in the way of driving change in an organization. Note, we will beat you, all right? Because that's what it takes, single-minded determinants in terms of being able to drive it. In fact, your job is to adapt, change, or die. That's what we have to focus on. Adapt, change, or die. And that's really the only alternatives. I heard about people talking about earlier about whether you should fire them sooner. Absolutely. You know exactly when you should be firing people. It's the first thing you think. When you think, should I fire this person? The answer is yes. It's never, well, let me, oh, let me evaluate. If you're already starting to think about it, you better be doing it. I can tell you, again, no one's ever regretted firing someone too fast, ever. So adapt, change your time. I'm not talking about just change for change's sake, because who gets into a car, locks in the steering wheel, puts on the, the gas pedal and pushes it down? No one. That would be stupid. I'm talking about driving change. And, I, and I've seen these plans, all of our plans, I've seen plan after plan, and everybody thinks success looks like the left-hand side of the slide, but I've always found it to look like the right-hand side. So you just need to understand that change is always going to be, and, and we'll learn in a few minutes, no one's going to die as part of that. And you have to be those agents of change, those leaders that I talk about, what I call clock changers. When I went to Kodak, I was so excited to go to work for that company. I mean, come on, I'm going to be the chief marketing officer of a Fortune 100 company. I mean, I showed up a week early. I jumped on a plane, flew to Rochester, New York, before I passed the urine test or anything. I was on the plane. I'm sitting next to this 25, 26-year-old gal. I'm trying to engage her. I want her to have a conversation with me because I want her to ask me what I do so I can tell her, you know? <laughs> and I can remember we were in this conversation. She starts talking about herself, yada, 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 like I want to hear any of that shit, blah, 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 you know? And finally she takes a break and she says, well, what do you do? I said, well, thank you for asking. I said, I'm the chief marketing officer of Eastman Kodak. And she said, who's that? It's an absolutely true story. But I, when I got to Kodak, I wanted to find out what kind of team I had. So I, I, I like to mess with people. I'm sure many of you do, or you wouldn't be in the positions you are. I mean, we like to drive change. We, so I like to cause the tension, as I like to say. And so I, I, I called a meeting of my team to get together much like this. And, and, and I had 2,500 marketing people that reported me at the time. But I just said, hey, let's bring in my, my core team, about like this. And, um, and so I decided to get to the room early, and there was a clock on the wall. So I jumped on a chair, and I went up there, and I changed the clock, moved it ahead by about 20 minutes. Because when people walked in, I wanted to see what they do. So they showed up on what they thought was on time. They'd look at their watch, look at the clock, look at the watch, look at the clock, look at the watch, and they'd look at the, the, the agenda and say, hey, hey, who, that clock's wrong. And then pretty soon somebody said, what time do you have? What time do you have? And they start checking around, and then they said, well, somebody should do something. This is outrageous. Clock's wrong. We should do something about it. And pretty soon they're trying to call a committee meeting, and, and they, they'd say, we should call somebody. They, who do we call? And they start looking up the departments, because there is departments in these kinds of companies, because we had hundreds of buildings. And this went on and on and on, so I stopped and I finally said, let's just go, and we go. And this went on for weeks. Every meeting, people walk in, look at the clock, look at their watch, they repeat this, and pretty soon, you know, frickin' committee meetings are dropping up and you know, drafting policies about clocks changing. And finally I said, why didn't somebody just do something about it? So this woman got up, she went over to the clock, she put a chair underneath her, she hiked up her dress, she stood on the chair and she changed the frickin' clock. I named her my chief of staff the very next day. It's a true story, she's running like a $500 million company day. That's what we're looking for. That's what most of us are looking for. In this room, that's what you should be looking for, especially as you're starting this company up. You want clock changers. People who just say, I don't give a crap whether it's my department or this. I'm going to change it because it needs fixing. That's what we want. We want to drive it. And we want to look for people who are driving those clock changing. In fact, we want problem solvers, not seekers. I don't need people bringing me freaking problems. I got that all day long. I want people who bring me solutions. Be looking for those people. Be looking for people who are cheerleaders to the process. People that, are, that, that want to change the process and see it and continually improve it because that's what it should be. I call these people, you know, white buffaloes. White buffaloes. This is like where I've come from in South Dakota. These are the most sacred animals in the world. They stand out in the, in the middle of the herd. And by the way, everybody's going to be trying to attack them like wolves, trying to kill these things because they're different. But that's what we want. We want those clock changers, those, those seam operators that operate between the seams and across the seams. That's what we're looking for. I found that in everything that I've been doing over all these 250 businesses I've bought and sold and been a part of in some fashion, some good, some bad, there's five things that drive success or that people are afraid of in order to be able to win. Number one, fear that we're afraid. We should be afraid. It's different. Look, all my life I wanted to be a cowboy. 
I did. I always wanted to be a cowboy. And I, and I grew up in the military. My father's in the military. We moved from place to place. And all my life, I couldn't do it. Finally, in my 30s, I said, I got a place in South Dakota. And I said, I'm going to be a cowboy. So I went out and got, I bought some horses. And before I bought the horses, I bought the saddles, the, the trailer. And, and I got some books like Horses for Dummies. I watched the videos. I, I talked to people who had horses because I wanted to know what it was. And I remember I got, the, I got a saddle for me, for my wife, my son, my daughter, and an extra one just in case. And, 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 and the trailer. And I remember getting the horses. And I brought them. I, I decided to take them to a stable first because I thought if I took him to the stables but you know because if I took him to my ranch let him loose I might not catch him again so so I decided if I went to the stables I could kind of like see what other people were doing and hang around their horses be friendly and get to know all the whole horses you know how that goes and then now I just don't give a shit but now but then but then I really cared about all that stuff and and so I remember I got the horses out and I'm I'm saddling for the first time because I'm riding my horse man and and I remember you know he had the reins out and I don't know if you've ever seen these things the ears got to go here and there it's it's, a, it's frustrating and I put the bit in wrong it's upside down so I got to turn it around and then I put the uh, blanket on then the saddle and, and then he starts bucking around and so the saddle goes underneath him and he's getting irritated and I, I didn't know how to do it. I was frustrated. I didn't know what to do. So finally I looked around and there's like oh, way over there was this young girl about 60 yards away so I walked over to her and there's this like little petite like 14 year old girl and you know being a big strong strapping cowboy I said can you help me saddle my horse? <laughs> right? In order to be a maestro, you gotta to learn to play a lot of bad notes. And it's scary. It's scary. But I'm telling you guys, in what you're doing, the fear only lasts for a second or two. It's like jumping off that high dive for the first time. If you've ever done that, I'm scared of heights. I'm petrified of heights. I mean, I get a nosebleed if I wear two pairs of socks. That's freaking funny too, people. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm giving you my best shit here, let's go. And I'm not getting paid for this, by the way, either. So, doing his favor. <laughs> Fuck off, Gerald. <laughs> it's like, he's got photos, that's what the problem is. And you remember the high dive, remember the high dive, you're on that and you're all like, oh my God, no, 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 no. And then you jump. About halfway down you're going, I can't wait to do this again. Well, that's what it's like for most of what we've got to do. That's just the way it is. The fear only lasts for a couple of seconds. Number two, tension. Your job should be like the chief tension officer in the company. It has to be. When I went to Kodak, man, that's all I tried to do. I was the chief tension officer. My job was to take everybody from the center of the stage and move them to the edge. Oh, and then you're going to have people like HR and legal, those bastards. And you're going to have those people. Yeah, I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen. Those people are going to try to drag you back to the middle where it's safe and nice. <laughs> you got to tell them that's not their job. See, their job is to make sure that you don't fall off. Help you set the parameters, but you set the business rules. You drive the business. You just got to tell them to keep you out of trouble. That's the job. That's their job. They have a saying in sports, no pain, no gain. Now, why don't we have tension in business? You've got to put the business in tension at all times. Driving tension drives the gain that you have to have. Number three, radical transparency. I believe in operating radical transparency. In my first book, I actually talked about when I owned a print shop and I was in cash trouble. Huge trouble. And I wasn't honest with my employees. And one of them went out and made a mistake and tried to save me thousands and thousands of dollars and bought a truckload of paper when I couldn't afford it. Had I told him what kind of shape I was in at the time, he wouldn't have made that mistake. Almost put me under. See, employees will figure out when things aren't going well, when things are coming in COD, right? Or when you start buying a brand new Mercedes or maybe another fancier car or something like that, that things are going better. Be radically transparent. I think it's easier today, and I think you guys practice it more out here than any other part of the country, but I've always believed in just telling it like it is. That's at least paramount to what I do in my career. Number four, take risk. Look, I was in one of the biggest fights ever in business history, front page of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times. I was in this fight. We decided at Kodak to go into the inkjet business to, come, to go up against the biggest company at the time in this business. I call them Big Ink. You know what I'm talking about. They make these inkjet printers, and we decided we were going to go in competition with them. And their model is basically take the inkjet printer off the shelf for basically for free. But the cartridges are locked up behind the counter because they're like gold, right? You know what I'm talking about. Now, I can't tell you their names because of the legal problems that I'm in, so I'll just give you their initials, HP. So, <laughs> so we're in this fight against Big Ink, and we decided what we're going to do is charge a fair price for the printer, half price for the ink. 
and we were still going to make a killing. This is the most expensive liquid on the face of the earth. It's unbelievable. More expensive than human blood. I was watching the news last night. They were talking about, oh, the price of oil, price of oil. Hell, they should put up the price of ink. I'm telling you, you know, you know what's more expensive than oil? It's on the table right now, per ounce. More expensive than oil, bottled water. You know what's more expensive than bottled water? Huh? I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> vodka. Vodka's more expensive than bottled water. More expensive than vodka is champagne. More expensive than champagne if you had too much vodka and champagne? Life-saving penicillin. And more expensive than penicillin. Champagne, vodka, bottled water, and oil times a factor of 10? Ink! <laughs> and there's no freaking reason for it. This company made $9 billion last year just off of ink jet cartridges. Do you know what it would take you to fill up your car with ink? <laughs> right now, you're filling up your car, 20 gallons, 80 bucks. You're freaking outraged. You're going, this is, this is bullshit. And you're filling it up going, I pay 80 bucks. I can't believe that. If you have a big, like, Randler land over 120, you're going, this is crazy. You know what it costs you to fill up your tank with ink from Big Ink? Anyone want to guess? Come on. A thousand, not even close. Four hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars. <laughs> now at Kodak, I was only going to charge you half that, okay? <laughs> because we cared. <laughs> we loved you. <laughs> so I decided we had to show the decadence of this model. I had to poke a finger in the eye of Big Ink. And every time I did, they would talk about it, and I get to say, Price Inc. stinks, and that was our model. We'd go after the high burners, and I decided what we'd do is show what we found out that the, the high burners, those that use eight cartridges per year as opposed to four cartridges per year, loved movies. I said, great, we're going to show a little clip in a motion picture before it goes, a little commercial, and they'll see this, and then they'll text us. We'll do a mobile campaign. And folks, this was like five or seven years ago, before anyone was doing mobile campaigns. We decided to be cutting edge. I said, let's do it. So we hired Vinny Pastore. You remember Vinny Pastore? He played Big Pussy on The Sopranos. All right? I mean, who to show the de better to show the decadence of this model than Big Pussy, right? A gangster. This is what the, the clip was, the, the, the commercial. He pulls up onto the East River wearing, in a black Lincoln Continental wearing a black leather coat. He gets out. He's got a baseball bat. He walks around to the trunk of the car. He opens up the trunk of the car. He looks down inside at what you think's a body. The camera shot is looking up out of the trunk at him as he leans over and he goes, You've been lying to us. You've been cheating us. You've been robbing us blind. The family says, You've got to go. And then we show a picture of an HP inkjet printer in the trunk. <laughs> he takes it out. He puts it on the ground. He beats it with a baseball bat. He wraps a chain, ties a cement block, and he throws it into the river. He gets back into the car, puts his arm around a Kodak printer, and he says, Welcome to the family. The headline says, don't get whacked by high inkjet price, text such and such, and get 50% off. Well, I tested this. Double digit response. Double digit. As a marketer, I'm peeing my pants. I mean, where did you ever get double digit response? I mean, this is pretty cool. The double digit response on the campaign, I'm going, this is awesome. Let's go nationwide. Let's move it, make it happen. So we did. That weekend, we went out to motion pictures all over the country. I'm going from motion picture theater, motion picture people, watching people. This is exciting. This is unbelievable. I walk in Monday morning, wait to see the number of texts that we got. I sit down at my desk. Two people walk in, and on there is a sheet. They got a sheet of paper with the number of texts that we got over the weekend. They slide it across my desk. I pick it up. I look at it. On there is the number two. What do you mean two? Like two million? They go, no, Jeff, two. I go, come on. I spend, we spent a couple million dollars on this. You tell me you got two? I'm going to tell you right now, that's not a good rate of return. All right? That's not good. This is not good. I said, get everybody that's involved in the campaign in the room. We got in a room together, about 30 people. I said, somebody please explain to me. I said, this was, this was unbelievable. We tested this. Double did response. I said, even the people, the SVP CEO, someone would find this freaking funny. I mean, this was good. This was awesome. And you're telling me all we got was two texts. I'm going to have to stand before, to, before the board of directors. And the chairman of this company, I'm going to have to explain this freaking campaign. This is not good. Somebody please explain to me what the hell went wrong with this campaign. And finally, someone raised their hand in the back of the room. I said, what? They said, Jeff, what do you do when you walk into a motion picture theater with your phone? What do you do? I said, where the hell were you when we came up with this idea, right? <laughs> I turned back to the team. I said, my bad. 
I'm the one that came up with this. I thought it was a hell of an idea. No one died. No one died. Now tell me how we can use this asset because this is a great asset. What can we do? What can we repurpose? How can we change it? Because, you know, we might be embarrassed now, but well, this is a damn good asset. What can we do? We repurposed it. It became the second or third biggest campaign for the year that we did. We grew that product line by 1,247% that year. As a leader, you got to take risk. And for the most part of all the stuff that I've heard that you're doing in this room, no one's going to die. Maybe a paper cut, all right? Strain a little muscle, lose a little sleep. But by and large, of all the things that we're doing in this room, no one's going to die. So take risk. Number three is promises, driving promises. This is the biggest thing that you've got to have in your business. I watch more businesses fail because they fail to drive promises. What I call mutual conditions of satisfaction. Let's see if it works like this. You ever been to McDonald's to drive up? You pull up to the drive up, the first window you shout out your order. The next window you pay your money, you pull up to the next window expecting to get your food, but it doesn't always work that way. In fact, what happens is they come to you and they say, I'm sorry, it's not quite ready. If you pull up to this little window over here, we'll bring your food out to you. Has that ever happened? Come on, has it ever happened? Yes, some of you, it's, yeah, it's happened because most of you aren't making eye contact. So yes, I understand that. So do what I do, fight back. When somebody comes to the window and says, I'm sorry, it's not quite ready. If you pull up over there, say, no, thank you, I'll wait. And I'll roll my window back up. <laughs> oh yeah, this is what happens next. I'll tell you what happens next. Pretty soon, the 14-year-old assistant manager comes over and knocks on your window. <laughs> All right? 14-year-old assistant says, sir, I'm sorry. If you, if you don't pull forward, you're going to hold everybody up. I'm, I go, I don't mind. I'll wait. And I roll my window back up. And you know why they do this? Do you know why these people do this? I'll tell you why. Because clowns lie. That's why they lie. <laughs> Pretty soon, the 16-year-old manager comes over and knocks on your window. Said, sir, is there a problem? I said, yeah, there's a problem. You're asking me to pull over here to parking purgatory. You're trying to renegotiate the promise. I gave you my order. You took it. I gave you my money. You took it. I'm here to get my order. You're not giving it to me. No, I'm not going to parking purgatory. And unless you're going to give me one of those big minty shakes or one of those apple pies I like, I'm not pulling forward. I rolled my window back up. Pretty now when I go to McDonald's, I shout out my order. I pull up the first window. I pay my money. I get to the second window. My food is thrown into the window as I drive by. Driving promise, what I call mutual conditions of satisfaction. In everything that we do, there's a performer and there's a customer. Internal, external, with vendors, with employees, and certainly with your customers, even in personal relationships. How many of you ever made a promise to your kids, said you're going to take them to Disney World or something like that and had to try to back out of it? What's the first thing they said? You promised. See, everything in our business should be about promises. In fact, that's the way you should be talking about it with your people. What's your promise? Because when you ask people what their promises are instead of what are you going to get done, what's your promise? That's what we deliver. Promises. You hold those secret, sacred. Now, the last, as I start to wrap down, I think we're almost out of time. Is that right, Jared? I just want to make sure. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm going to wait for questions afterward. Now, because this is fun. You put the quarter in, you get to go for the full ride, folks. <laughs> I want you to ask you about who you are and what you do. When I was at Code, I got over 3,500 vendors who came to me. 3,500 vendors. I've sat through these presentations because I started trimming them down. By the time I left, I was down to 170. I was knocking them out left and right because I had too many vendors, too many things. It, was less, it wasn't a very efficient or effective process. And so I started asking them to give me their pitches, and they would come in and do their elevator pitch. And their elevator pitch turned out to be like a 48-page PowerPoint presentation an hour. And an hour later, I still don't know what the hell these people did. So I said, finally, I said, we're going to put some parameters around it. So I created what was called the 118 at the time. The 118, what I said, the new elevator pitch. Because I live in South Dakota, the tallest building in the entire state. Nine stories tall. It's a Holiday Inn City Center. Have you ever been there? Anybody? No? It's got one of those rotating ballrooms. It doesn't work anymore, but we have one. All right? It was cool back in college and high school. You could take a date there. And then but the bad thing was when you went to the bathroom and came back, she'd moved on you. Oh, that's funny too, people. Come on. <laughs> So I call the 118, here's what it is. You got 118 seconds to tell your story. That's the Elevator Pitch 2.0, the digital version. Eight seconds is the average attention span of an adult. I know that to be true because I looked it up on the internet, okay? Eight seconds, that's what you got, it's called the hook. In sales parlance, it's a hook. Your eight second statement to get in what I call, you know what I'm talking about. When someone says something so provocative, you want to lean in and hear the rest of the story. That's it, what's your eight second hook? 
And then you've got 110 seconds. See, that's the hour, hour, average elevator ride in New York City from the time you press the button, wait for the doors to open, step on, ride up or ride down and get off. That's how much time you have. And some people say, well, that's not enough time. Don't tell me that. If Moses can do it in two PowerPoint slides of five bullet points each, <laughs> and he had something more difficult to sell. You can do this. And then, and then I know you're passionate. Just like I told you, the people at Kodak were passionate. They're passionate, but it takes more than just passion to run your business. I was passionate about pheasants. I love pheasants. A number of years ago, I started a pheasant farming operation. I tried to corner the market on pheasants until I realized there wasn't one. <laughs> no, seriously, I had like thousands of acres, tens and tens of thousands of pheasants, okay? And I love pheasants. I love to, to watch them run around, little ring necks, little feathers, and, and I love to get a gun, hunt them down, and kill them, okay? I love pheasants. I love them. And I, and I had pens the size of football fields, and I put telephone poles up around the fields, and I strung nets over them so that the pheasants could run free before I killed them. <laughs> and I had one night in South Dakota a torrential thunderstorm which it rolls through every single day a thunderstorm in the summer and I had like in, in a one 30 minute period uh, three, uh, three inches of rain huge and I had 10,000 pheasants that huddled up into one of those pens in the corner and they, they looked up in the sky and they opened their little beaks and they drowned these are the stupidest fucking birds on the face of the earth <laughs> Okay, they call birds fowl and pheasants are the primary reason, right? <laughs> Don't just be passionate. Know what it is. And what do you look like? I talked about, you know, your image, the way you look. People at Kodak would come to me and say, Jeff, oh, wish we could look like, you know, like we used to. Like, why can't we be like we used to be? And I said, you can't be cool and dress like Elmer Fudd. <laughs> you can't. You got to, you, I mean, look, I'm eye candy. <laughs> All right? Super chunky size, right? That's what you, but it's okay. Be what you are. See, now you guys talk about brand. I hear you talk about brand in the breaks, and, and you talk about brand in a, in a very esoteric way. Let me tell you the definition of brand. I don't want you to forget this. Because, see, a lot of people think they control their brand. They, 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 they can shape it. You can shape it, but you're there to nurture it. See, brand is two things. Brand, first of all, is something that we always put on a cow and occasionally a horse. In fact, that's where the word brand came from. It's from cowboys like me who turn our cattle loose in the summertime, and we turn them loose with our neighbors in this big area, and then we brand them so that when we separate them, we know who owns it. It's the iconic representation of ownership on the side of a bovine. That's a brand. And now it means that it relates to a company, and what does that mean? It's a promise delivered. So I want you to think about what is the promise that you deliver to your customers. Because that's your brand. And by the way, it's different for every single customer. And you might think that you own it or control it, but you really just shepherd it. Let me let you leave with this last and final statement. When I was in college in South Dakota, one of the things that I got to do as a student was bring speakers onto campus. Some of the greatest minds in the world, Mikhail Gorbachev, Margaret Thatcher, who passed this last week, and, and uh, oh, Ellie Wiesel, <laughs> Ralph Nader, remember Ralph Nader? I picked him up in a 1976 Ford Pinto at the airport. For those of you who are laughing, explain it to the younger people who don't know what the fuck we're talking about. It was one of the biggest recalls of all times. And uh, he would not get in the car. <laughs> I had to borrow, I, I, I was a poor college student, I had to borrow 20 bucks from somebody at the airport to put him in a cab and I followed behind my little brown pinto. And then I got to bring Jacques Cousteau. Remember Jacques Cousteau? Jacques Cousteau, one of my heroes. I used to watch, you know, on Sunday night I watched the, the wonderful world of Disney. This is what we did when I was a kid. And then we watched the Mutual, King, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And then, and, then, and then we'd watch the undersea adventures of Jacques Cousteau. And, and here I was going out to dinner with him the night before. And we're having wine and we're, he's regaling me with all these stories. It was awesome. And he's telling me about this one story where he's down deep, about 110 feet underwater. And at that level, when you come up, you have to come up in stages because you might, have to, you might get the bends. You have to decompress. And if you don't do that, you can die. And he was coming to the end of his, of his time, and he was looking at his watch and seeing that he was running out of his air time. And, and so he was in a cave, and as he started coming out of the cave, he severed his air hose. And at that, at that level of depth... The pressure is so intense that what little air he had left just streamed out. In a millisecond, he realized he's going to die if he doesn't get to the top. And even though he might risk getting the bends, he's going to go. And he takes off as fast as he can. 
And somewhere along the way, someone stops him, basically tackles him underwater. And it was his swimming buddy. And even though he was running low on air, he took off his mask and he shared it with Jacques. And they made their way in stages back and forth and he made it to the very top. And as you know, because he told the story, he lived. But I said to him, I said, Mr. Cousteau, weren't you scared? Weren't you petrified? And he, this is what he said to me. He said, Jeffrey, one should never be scared when you're in good company. So today, if you look around, your hosts and the people around you, you're in great company. And thank you for allowing me to be in your company. I know we're running late, so you want to take questions? We'll take some questions. Let's take some questions. Who's got a question? Thank you. You can clap if you want. That's all right. You can clap. Thank you. Nor normally it's a standing ovation, but we'll take the clapping as much as possible. Now you guys really know I work with Trump now at this point, don't you?